Let us pray. Prepare our hearts, O God, to hear your word and obey your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 7. And this can be found in your pew Bible in the New Testament, page 244. Our friends, we want you to know what God's grace has accomplished in the churches, the churches of Macedonia. They have been severely tested by the troubles they went through, but their joy was so great that they were extremely generous in their giving. Even though they are very poor, I can assure you that they gave as much as they could and even more than they could. Of their own free will, they begged us and pleaded for the privilege of having a part in helping God's people in Judea. It was more than we could have hoped for. First, they gave themselves to the Lord, and then, by God's will, they gave themselves to us as well. So we urge Titus, who began this work, to continue it and help you complete this special service of love. You are so rich in all you have, in faith, speech, and knowledge, in your eagerness to help, and in your love for us. And so we want you to be generous also in this service of love. October is, of course, for me, the kickoff to the holiday season, as I was telling the kids. But October in the church also means it's stewardship time. And, you know, it's interesting when stewardship time comes around, I tend to cringe quite a bit. 
And I have to talk a little bit about that today so you understand why, but you need to know a little background on me. Those of you who don't know this, I was a professional fundraiser for many years, administrator and organizer for the American Heart Association. And part of my job for what is the largest health-related nonprofit in America was to go out and get people to give money. People like CEOs and presidents out of their charitable uh, um, accounts, you know, that they had, whatever they had budgeted, get them to give money. Individuals to get out and raise money in the American Heart Walk and in our, our Jump Rope for Heart and Hoops for Heart and all these different programs. There were several. Research lunches, it just goes on, many, many different forms. And I have to tell you, I was pretty good at asking people for money. And I've reflected on why that was, why that worked so well. It's because I believed in the mission. The mission of the American Heart Association is to reduce loss of life due to cardiovascular events. Now, they're also the American Stroke Association. And when I, had, when I was an administrator with them, our goal was to reduce death related to heart attack by 25% in 10 years. And they did it. Pretty close, I understand. I, I haven't been there for a while. And when I would go out and I would talk to people, when I would go there, it's coming from experiences of having talked to people that were researchers and people that were showing me where those dollars went that helped give us bypass surgeries and, and heart medications and pacemakers and AEDs and all that stuff. Uh, you know, I had a little part in some of that in the state in raising funds to help that happen in a national way. I'm very proud of that. And I would talk to people who had experienced life because somebody was able to save their life because of what research had done or through the educational opportunities we offered. We were, I was responsible, and I say I because there were only two of us in the state that, in that part of the Northwest Wisconsin doing it, that was involved in providing the necessary materials for education. And I had absolutely no qualms sitting in front of a CEO and say, can we put you down for $50,000? didn't even blink about that. But when it comes to talking about the church and the need to support it, for some reason, I can't do it very well. And I've wondered about that. I've examined that. And I've been, over the last several years, looking back at my experience as a fundraiser and trying to understand what's so different. Is not what we do in the church important is not the message of Jesus Christ about life and living and future and promise are not the words of Jesus when he says, because I live, you too shall live. Or when he says things of the nature of, you know, what I am is the bread of life, the giver of life. I have come so that you might live life and live it more abundantly. Is that not as least as important as the message that I offered from the American Heart Association? I realize it is. And why then is this reluctance for us to talk about money in the church, at least for me? Now, others can do this pretty well. I never have. I've always been reluctant and kind of hold back and say, well, you know, whatever. Then I read Paul. This letter from Paul this year uh, that we have before us is a result of a stewardship theme that we're following for, it's called First We Give of Ourselves. If you haven't got mail, you will. Email, letters, you'll get all kinds of stuff about it. But it is, it is from this passage of Scripture. And let me tell you, having written a lot of fundraising language, I know a fundraiser when I read one, and that was Paul in his letter, second letter to Corinthians. So listen to what he's saying. He's saying, friends... Those generous people in, that I come to represent today, they have given so very much. They're so generous and good, even though they're, well, pretty poor. But they found the resources, and they are supporting our brothers and sisters in Jerusalem, and I'm so proud of the Macedonians. But they're a poor people. Now, he's talking to the church in Corinth, by the way, that were fairly well-to-do. They, they were one of the richest cities in the ancient world. And he says, I'm so proud of them, and they've done so much. They've even gone beyond. Though they were poor, they went beyond and gave so much, and I'm proud of them. And I'm proud of you, too, because of the good things you do, the faith you have, the, the way you live out your faith, and, and it's so wonderful. And, and now it's time for you to give. I know a fundraiser when I read one. 
he was using a, a, a method that is common in fundraising today. First, you talk about what others are doing and how they're making it happen. And then you talk about how lucky we are and how good we are and how well off we are. And then now it's a little bit of a guilt message, isn't there? Just a little bit in there, but also competition. And we studied methods and reasons and motivations for, uh, in, in my profession a lot, my old profession. We, there were books written on it. What motivates people to give? And when I was in that business, which is back in the 90s, we recognized there was an area that was hands-off, and that was the church. That's gone now, all the literature. Churches are no longer considered a special section that we cannot, as when going back to my last hat, that we can't enter into that piece of the pie. Now the entire charitable pie is open as far as nonprofits are concerned. And we have a lot of them here. And there's nothing wrong with that. They do good work. But Paul was saying, the first thing we do is give our ourselves. So what did he mean by that? And how is the church different? And why do I have this reluctance that I have worked on so long? I think it goes to my childhood. I don't know about you. I grew up in a household where money was not discussed. It just simply wasn't talked about. Neither was religion. And when it was, there was trouble. Each and every time there was trouble when that subject came up. I want to give you an example of a story from my childhood. It was about my father, and he's passed away now. So, but my father was this, this uh, Dutchman, and in, if, if there is a stereotype about Dutchman that's true, he earned it, he was really tight. But he was a great provider, but he just didn't think that money was something you just gave away. So knowing that about him, I was living with him after high school for a while. He'd been divorced from my mother for years, and he'd remarried. And his family, uh, my, my, I guess, stepmother, uh, my would be, I guess, a stepbrother, and my half-sister had all gone to church that day. It was Sunday, and they went to a Roman Catholic church just down the road. And Dad and I are sitting there waiting for football to start up, because that's what you do on Sunday afternoon, right? And I'm aware there's a game at noon, by the way. And that's what you do on Sundays. And... He, and we're sitting there, and he got bored waiting, you know, there's something on TV, he didn't care, so he started going through the mail that was piled up by his table where he insisted it be put, and he was sitting in his recliner, and he's going through the mail, and he picks up what looks like a booklet about this big, maybe a quarter inch thick, and all of a sudden I see him paging through that, and he got angry, and I don't know why. I didn't see what the book was then, and I couldn't figure out what is it, you know. This has got to be something because he's getting pretty angry, you know. And, you know. and then I found out when my stepmother got home. This was the annual report from her Roman Catholic Church with all the names and how much everybody had given that year. And the first thing Dad did was go in there and run down to find his name or her name and see what that was. Now, the ensuing conversation that followed, I will tell you, was a little less than pleasant. <laughs> Dad had, uh, had a short fuse, and he was kind of loud, but he was never uh, you know, abusive on that way. But he, he got worked up, and he was passionate. And so I, I listened to all of that going back and forth and everything. And about I waited a week, maybe two, till I asked him, what was the problem? And I said, was it that your name was in there? You didn't like that? Was it how much she gave or how little she gave? What was, what was the big deal? And what it was, and he finally told me this in his own way, that he was embarrassed. He was embarrassed that his name was in a book going around a community that he was very concerned about and lived in. He was embarrassed that that same community now knows how much money or the little money he gave. It was a comparison that he was offended by. The fact that he would be compared with his neighbor across the street and that, and he was outraged at that church of which he knew nothing. He'd never darkened that door of that church his entire life. And I happen to know the church, and they do and did a lot of wonderful things. He was embarrassed because it was about him, it was about money, and it was connected to the church, and now people knew. And I got thinking about that. You know, is that not an attitude that we have? Is that not an attitude that we have about money when it comes to the church? And I don't, you know, and, and it's in me, you know. I think about that a lot. And so it's hard for me to come and say to you, support the church, we need your funds. It supports the programs and the staff and all of the good things we do in this church. You know, but it's a necessary message to give. 
because what we do here matters. What happens through this church, through you, in the work you do in the church, outside the church, is making a difference in people's lives every day in this community and through our missional outreach in the state and in the world. This is one of the number one churches in giving in missions per capita, all the churches in the state. You should be proud of that. Why do we give to anything? What motivates us to do it? And that is what Paul understood, and I'm beginning to get a little glimpse of, but I really would have learned it if I was paying attention when I was doing this professionally. I would recognize people really give for a couple of reasons. They give out of concern and empathy for others. So that's what the message of American Heart was all about. You can help this person, you can help these people, and here are people who have been helped. We get out of concern for ourselves. They knew that too. So we would talk about it's the number one killer of people. It's, it, it, more people die of heart disease every year than the next six causes combined. I got all the statistics. It's the number one cause of birth defects related to the heart. All kinds of reasons why you should care for others, for yourself. But the one thing that is so important, and now as I reflect back on my time working for American Heart, when people gave the most of themselves, gave the most of their resources, gave the most of their volunteer hours and all that, was out of gratitude, thanksgiving. I got this experience in a real way, and if I'd have been paying attention at the time, it wouldn't be five, 10 years later I'm realizing this, there, one day in the, in the office, we got a check that came in, $100,000, no strings, just to American Heart, through my region. And as a fundraiser, I was just jumping up and down because you have to make goals, and I just made the goal, the only one in six states to do it because this happened to be during the year when 911 took place, 2001. So I was very excited. And I wanted to know what, you know, I wanted to thank this person, and so the you know, check has address and name. And I wrote, and I, and I did a phone call. I figured $100,000 worth of call. And I was able to get the person's number because I knew through our professional fundraising who this person was. And I called up and I said, this is just right out of the clear blue. Why did you do this? He said, because I'm thankful. I'm thankful I'm alive today. And the doctor told me that the surgery I had, the procedure, was made possible because of research the American Heart Association did. And I want to show my gratitude, my thanks, thankfulness, that I'm still alive. I thought that was amazing. It isn't because they heard me get up there and talk about the importance of heart disease and taking care of yourself and all of the, the statistics and all of that, great as that all is. It wasn't because someone in their family you know, or, or they were afraid for themselves, it was an expression of gratitude. And is that not what giving is about? And ought it not be what giving in the church is about? And maybe that's that confusion between giving for something because of it helps others or sometimes it helps me. And the definition between that giving and giving out of gratitude to a God who has given us Jesus Christ and because he has given us Jesus Christ, we may live and live abundantly. We do not give to pay the bills. We do not give because we need to have a facility. Those are all things that are this side of giving. The reason that we can give joyfully, as Paul speaks about, is because of gratitude for what Jesus Christ has done for you and for me. That makes it all together different and a completely different meaning. So the fundraiser, Paul, was trying this side. Here's all the reasons why you should give. Here's the statistics. You know, you don't want to let the Macedonians out, do you, people, do you? You know, in the church it might be, we don't want them Catholics and them Lutherans and them all that. We don't want them out doing us, do we? You know, the competition side. What Jesus Christ has done for you and for me, as he himself refers to, is that pearl without price, that's priceless. That treasure that one would sell everything to acquire, to have. The question is quite simple. What would you give for your life, your eternal life? What would that mean to you? How can you outgive what God has given to you? You can't. You can't. But what we can do is act in gratitude 
and thanksgiving and we can support what we see that is good and right and if that's what you believe if you think as I do that this church is doing some wonderful things then I ask you in joining me in supporting it not just with money as in needed as that is you know the treasurer would make sure I said that but it's true but with your presence you're here today that is supporting the mission of the church with your gifts yes your financial gifts but also your gifts of abilities and talents with those things that you can give to this church and to the work of Jesus Christ in the mission field that is right here. Don't have to go to Africa. God bless you if you can. But you've got a mission field here too, and so do I. And you have gifts that are needed and can be used to the further mission of Jesus Christ. And that, friends, is saying thank you. That's being grateful. Can't buy that can't explain it. I can't get too rational about it. You got to feel it. So feel it. Respond to it. Honor God. Be thankful. And whatever way that means to you, support the mission of God because it's the most important mission you or I will ever serve in. Leave you with these words of Jesus that have been in my mind for as long as I've been a pastor and had some role in what in the world I chose to go into this profession for, which my son, who is now entering it, asks me every day, Dad, why did you do this to me? Like I did it to him. He'll get over it. It's the words of Jesus Christ when he said, what does it profit someone? What does it profit one? If they gain the entire world, but they lose their soul. What's your soul worth to you? I know what it's worth to me. It's worth everything. And I'm grateful to the God that gives me the chance to live and live abundantly for as long as life should endure in this world and love of the life that is promised us all that lies beyond. That's worth everything. In Jesus' name, amen. And now may you go with the blessings of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit into this day, celebrating life, celebrating the grace of God, celebrating the gift that is God's gift to us of life and hope and future and promise and joy. In the midst of our tears, when we face these challenges of life, we can hold on to that hope and know that we'll make it 
and we'll make it with the Lord at our side. In his name, go in peace. Amen. Thank you.